That's the name of our new teaching series that begins right now. And uh, it's a little strange for me to be preaching a series like this because, as you know, we typically just choose the next book of the Bible and we start going verse by verse through it. And that's, that's, how, that's our jam here at The Journey. But we are doing a topical sermon series for the next eight weeks. It throws you out of whack. It throws me out of whack. But I do think this is worth our time. What this teaching series is about, it's about corporate worship. It's about the local gathering of the church, the local phys- physical gathering of believers to worship on a Sunday morning. That's what this is about. Now, when we say corporate worship, that sounds like such an official term, right? Corporate, send it to corporate. It sounds like business terminology or something, right? But corp- corporate comes from the Latin word corpus, which means body, and we are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ gathered together to worship. So this is corporate worship. That's what it's time for right now. So we're going to be talking about why we do the things that we do. Because If you come here on a gathering, uh, to a gathering on a Sunday morning, and you don't know why we are doing all of these things, then this assembly of the body of believers is going to start to feel like a colossal waste of time. It'll, It'll fall on your priority list week after week. If you don't know why, if this doesn't have a meaning to you, you value your time. And so you only give your time to things that you think are worth it. And if something doesn't have any meaning to you, it's not going to be worth any of your time. And so I wanted to create this series that would increase the value that we place on this gathering. Because if you don't, if you don't know what you're doing here, you're going to eventually stop going. You're going to, going to eventually be less consistent to this. And when you stop coming to church on a routine basis... You're going to stop reaping the benefits that God has in place at this local gathering. And and not only you, it's not only going to hurt and weaken your faith, it's going to hurt and weaken the faith of other Christians. That's the thing. When 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 we place less of a priority on going to the routine weekly gathering of worship amongst Christians, it hurts us as the individual, but it hurts the other people that we were meant to impact when we gather there. So when we don't go to church, it has a weakening effect on our faith every single time. And it has a weakening effect on the church as a whole. It's bad for us. It's bad for the kingdom. And so I want to talk about each and every component of the Sunday morning gathering so that we can increase what it means to us. We can, we can deepen what each of these things that we do means to us, and therefore, we, it, it, it'll matter more, we'll become more consistent, and we will have a, it'll have a strengthening effect. I mean, that's what corporate worship is. It's meant to have this strengthening effect upon our faith. It's to keep us healthy in our, in our spiritual walk with God. So, again, this experience, it has everything to do with what you think church is and what you think you're doing here right now. What do you think this is? What are you doing? What do you think you're doing showing up here today? What's the point? If you don't know the point, you won't come back or you won't be consistent. So I really want to help you deepen your answers to those two questions. Because right now, even as I ask that, it may cause you to think like, well, I'm not, uh, well I think I know. We question ourselves. I want to remind you of, maybe perhaps remind you of a lot of things you already know. But you need to be reminded of why you know what you know. Here's what I mean, though. Like, if you got the wrong mindset or the wrong idea about church, different things, you're, you're going to treat church differently. Like, like, if you merely think this gathering is a place that you come to be inspired or entertained, you're eventually going to become bored with the local gathering of the church. In the same way that you get bored with a movie. There can be a movie that's really good. Even your favorite movie of all time, you don't just sit there and watch it week after week after week. Even when you think of the Christmas movies that you're about to start watching or already have started watching, you watch them once a year. And that proves my point. You don't watch them all year long. You watch them once 
a year, just like the Christians who seem to only show up that one time a year, right? Because the rest of this doesn't really have any meaning to them. They just like the Christmas part. Right? So I mean, if, you, if you treat this as merely a place to become inspired or entertained, this is going to be boring. If you merely treat church as a place to go exercise your personal devotion and worship to God, boy, that sounds, that sounds more virtuous. Well, I, I at least do that. But if this is merely a place, that, that this is only an act of, of your personal devotion and worship to God, eventually this won't appeal to you. This will be annoying to you over time if that's all this is. Because if, it's, if this participation in this is just about your personal devotion to God, the annoying thing about that is there are other people here, <laughs> right? And they will annoy you. You have to interact with them, and that's a drag, right? It, it has to be about more than just your personal devotion and worship to God. If, if church to you is merely something that you feel like you, you have to do in order to do the right thing, you just, you're just here to do the right thing today. I think that's a big one. I think that's, a, that's probably the most common reason people get up in the morning and go to church at least somewhat consistently because, well, that's just what they should do. That's what they were programmed to do. And so uh, that's, that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to do the right thing. I want to stay on God's good side. But if you treat it like that, it's going to be, it's going to feel like this duty that you have, like, the, like showing up to the job and clocking in and clocking out as soon as possible just to get it done because that's the right thing to do. That's what you should do. You just don't want to be lazy. And so you'll come to church, well, people who think that la like that tend to, to come to church only when there's absolutely nothing else to do. Well, there's nothing else to do, so I guess I'll do what I'm supposed to do. I'll go to church today. But if you go to church and you, and you understand and believe what the Bible actually teaches about corporate worship, and, you, and you're informed by the Bible as to why we do this, what we're supposed to be doing when we're here, what this is meant to be, it can completely overhaul how you value this time together every single week. And maybe that's just what you need right now. Maybe that's exactly what you need. Because sometimes it feels like going to church is really, really hard. Sometimes you wake up on a Sunday morning and you just don't want to go. And there's a thousand reasons as to why you may just not want to go that day. So you just don't go. You know better, but you just don't go. Well, it could be that you just need to overhaul what you believe about this gathering. It could be that you just need to go back and to remember some of the things you, you learn. Again, like you, you used to understand this, and, and, and you know this is the right thing to do, but you can't remember why this is the right thing to do, why, why we should be doing this. So I want to have a disclaimer, though, at the beginning of this sermon series that says this. Here's what I'm not trying to do. I'm not trying to create a sermon series that would beat you down and make you feel guilty every week for not prioritizing church the way you should. <laughs> like, I, I, I'm not here to kick you every time you come. I, I, I don't like sit and prep sermons and thinking, wow, how, how can I beat the crap out of them this Sunday emotionally uh, into complying with the Christian life? That's, that is not how I write sermons. That's not how I think about this gathering. That is not what I want to do. You already feel guilty for enough stuff that you don't get right in your life. You don't need me piling onto that. I know. That's not what I'm trying to do. I am trying to help you make the most of every worship service that you do attend throughout the year. I want you to make the most, uh, to, to maximize the benefits that are before you right now. They are before you right now. But if you don't have meaning attached to this, you're not going to walk away with those benefits. It's not going to change you. It's not going to impact you. It's not going to matter to you. So I want to focus in on those details. I want to do three things today. This is our focus of the entire sermon. I want, you to under, I want to convince you of these two things first. I want to convince you that Christians belong in corporate worship routinely. I think, okay, well that one should be pretty easy. The second thing I want to convince you of, I want to convince you that having other Christians to worship with is a gift from God. That one's going to take a little more convincing. And then I want to end this sermon with just six really practical ways to help you make Sunday mornings more meaningful. Just six really practical tips, like six tips to a better life at the end of the sermon today. I'm, 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 doing, I'm doing it. It's happening. So let's, you know, again, the, convincing you that you should be in church every single Sunday, 
that's kind of one of those things like, well, duh, of course the pastor would say that, right? We are going to look at a, a passage of Scripture that does teach that, and, there's, and we could go to several passages of Scripture that show that. I want to focus in on one today. But, but convincing you that having other Christians to worship with in your life is a gift, that's a little tougher because it's the people that make this difficult. You people. <laughs> Right? How often have you had this sentiment in the back of your mind? Maybe you've even said it out loud. Well, my problem with church isn't God, it's the people. Right? Isn't, isn't that so quippy and clever? Right? I, I get it though. Like, I felt that way. People are annoying. I don't like drama. I hate drama. Like, I can't even tell you how much I hate drama, and any gathering of people with any consistency whatsoever is going to be. Uh, inundated with drama. It's just, it's going to happen. There's going to be drama. But you know the drama that, of all the people gatherings I can think of, uh, the drama that I hate more than almost any other drama is church drama. I can't stand church drama. I try to do church in a way that would minimize that drama at church, but I mean, no matter what I do, I can't get rid of it. It's just part of it. It just comes with the territory. But here's the thing. Every Christian believer if you are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, you are a true, regenerate believer of the gospel, and you are saved by the grace of God. Here's something that will be true about you. You will have a special tolerance for the people of God, despite those people. You're going to have a special tolerance for them 100% of the time. And if you don't, I'm going to question your faith. I'm going to question the authenticity of, of your belief as a whole. In the same way that in James it says faith without works is dead. Amen. Isn't that true? Well, in the same way, faith without a special affection for the people of God is dead. It's not real. It's false. We learned that in Scripture too. That's a big one. 1 John 3, 14, John says it in a great way. He says, we know that we have passed out of death into life. Why? Because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. That's the litmus test for, for John as he's writing his epistle. He's saying, hey man, I know those people over there, they are genuine believers. I don't, even, I don't doubt their faith. I don't question their faith. I can see it. And the way that I can see it is they have a special affection for the people of God. You would never have that if you weren't really a believer because the people of God are just as messed up and sinful, it seems like, as the rest of the world. So why would you give them a time of the day? They can't stand them because they're messed up too. But if you have a special affection for those people, you know you're saved. It's a great way to examine someone's faith. It's a great way to do, examine your own faith. You ever have those times like, man, am I, am, I, am I real? Do I believe this? Am I a Christian? I don't, I don't know. Look around at some of the details of your life. Do you have a special affection for the people of God? That's one of the clues the Bible teaches us to look for to examine ourselves. You have a special affection for the people of God. Are you, do you judge yourself like that? That's, that's really what I want you to do. I want you to examine yourself today as we talk about these things, to judge yourself. It's really easy to trash another church and, 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 and trash your own church based on how they love individuals. It's really easy to just, you know, wad them up and throw them away. Uh, you know, we like to judge churches based on their love for us, right? Church isn't working for me. They're not really providing for me in the way I want provided for. They're not caring for me in the way I think they should care for me. They're not loving me and greeting me in the way I, they, I think they should be loving me and greeting me. And, but when we behave like that, when that's our focus, doesn't that say a multitude of what we really believe church is? Doesn't that say a ton about what we think the Christian faith is? I want us to think about our love as individuals for God's church. What's our mindset there? You know, if I, if, I if I measure my church experience on a Sunday morning, and if you measure your church experience on a Sunday morning based on how, pe how well people love you, we're never going to live up to your expectations, and you're never going to live up to my expectations, because nobody loves you as much as you do. <laughs> we can't do that. That's why the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. It presupposes the fact that you love yourself like crazy, right? <laughs> so, hey, God's trying to teach us how to love others. Uh, love them like you love yourself. Oh, that makes sense. I love myself a ton. I'm always looking out for myself, right? So are we loving the church? Do we have a special affection 
for God's people. Well, examine your life in this sense. So here, when we examine these things, we use the Bible to examine these things. And so even though we're doing a topical sermon series, we are going to be using our Bibles like crazy. We're going to be looking into the, the Word of God and examining these things, these different topics and aspects of, the, of corporate worship. And we're going to be looking as to looking at why they are, why they're important, and why we do them. And so this morning we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10. You may be looking at your half sheet and it says Hebrews chapter 11. What's the deal? Well, that's a typo. I sent Chris the wrong chapter. And it is actually Hebrews 10 today. Uh, verses 19 through 25. And so as we are reading together Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, I want you to consider why you as a Christian belong in corporate worship. And I want you to consider why having other Christians to worship with is an absolute gift from God that you should cherish, that you should treasure. So let's look at chapter 10, 19 through 25. Of Hebrews. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he, is, he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, some but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Boy, there's a lot to unpack right there, right? We spent 40 weeks as a church studying the book of Hebrews, just combing through it. it just, I, I absolutely cherish that sermon series just for my personal time of study and prep for those sermons. It's such a valuable book of the Bible to understand the gospel rightly. And there is a ton of information just in that one paragraph that we could spend dissecting. But I just want you... And if you're the type of person that highlights or circles or takes notes, I want you to, to see the three exhortations that are in the paragraph that I just read. And maybe you can circle them and, so that you can, your eyes can find them quickly as we study them. Here's the first one. Let us draw near to God. The second one, let us hold fast to our confession. And the third one, let us consider how to stir, one an stir up one another. So we're going to look at the first two today. We're going to save the next one for next week. What are we preaching on next week? Number three, let us consider how to stir up one another. So we're going to look at those first two. But here's the deal about all three of those exhortations. All three of those exhortations are responses to what Jesus has done. The ultimate motivating factor behind everything that we do as the local church is it's a response to Jesus. Church is not going to mean anything to you, and it's never going to feel worthwhile to you. It's not going to feel worth it to you if it's not a response to Jesus. That's the point. So if you're trying to make church about something else, it's not going to work for you. It's not going to make sense. It's not going to, you're not going to value it in the way that the Bible says you should. Everything we do is a response to the gospel of Jesus. Everything. So we have faith, as was mentioned in that paragraph. We have faith as a response to what Jesus has done. We have faith, we have hope as a response to what Jesus has done. We have love as a response to the fact that Jesus loved us, loved us first. That is why we are gathered right now. We are responding collectively as Christians to Jesus, to what he's done. So that's why you belong here. If you believe in the gospel of Jesus, this is how you respond. You gather with the people of God in corporate worship. We're responding to his life. We're responding to the meaning of his life. We're responding to his teachings. We're responding to his death, his resurrection, his ascension. We're responding to all of that every time we gather. Jesus means something to us. So... We gather. 
Every Sunday morning is a time to consider afresh what Jesus has done. When Christians do that, we're worshiping. So here's the thing. A failure to prioritize corporate worship, it's almost always t tied to a failure to apply the actual gospel to your own life and to your own heart. It, th those two always go hand in hand. When you don't want to gather with the people of God, that's probably when you need to gather with the people of God most because you are, you are not applying the gospel and the meaning of the gospel to your own heart. You're not preaching the gospel to yourself. You're not meditating upon it. The reason you don't want to go to corporate worship is because there is a distancing that's happening between you and the gospel. You're taking a little step away from it. Maybe it's not unbelief. Maybe it's, it's just there's... There's just distancing. And so you're never going to read the gospel and believe the gospel and think, oh, this is urging me to stay away from Christians. <laughs> that's, that's never going to happen. The gospel is why we gather. The gospel is what the gathering is for. And so we already know the pushback there, right? We've heard the pushback a, a million times to that truth. Well, going to church doesn't make me a Christian, right? Right? I don't have to prove to you. I don't have to go to church to prove to you I'm a believer. Blah, 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 blah. It's all trash. <laughs> it's not true. It's uninformed. That's, we're not talking about legalism here. I just spent 20 weeks in the book of Galatians, right? We're just, we're just beating the crap out of legalism every single Sunday. Legalism's bad. Stop being legalistic. 20 weeks in a row. I'm not getting legalistic now all of a sudden. I know that the only thing that has saved us is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is, that is the only thing that makes us acceptable to God. That is the only thing we have to boast in. But it, it's, and, the re, and the way that we boast is we gather. We gather and collectively boast. If you, ever, if you ever use the gospel of Jesus to justify not gathering for corporate worship with other believers, like, you don't see how that's a red flag? That's the whole point. The gospel is the whole point. It's the primary means by which we boast in the works of Christ. That's why we want to do this. That's why we, so if we're motivated by something else, it's never going to work for you. That, that passage in, in Hebrews 10, it says, Therefore, let us draw near to God. Let us draw near to God. We get to do this because of Jesus, and it's a privilege. Now, it's interesting, and we studied this when we looked at the book of Hebrews, the concept of drawing near to God. What does that mean? Well, it means a little bit something different in their day than it does to you and I. When you and I think about drawing near to God, we tend to think more uh, symbolically. Uh, we, we think of drawing near uh, to God spiritually. And so when they thought about drawing near to God in their day, when the book of Hebrews was written, there was a little more, oh, a lot more uh, of a literal sense in which they meant that. Because on the planet Earth, God's presence was literally represented in the temple. And so when they would celebrate and participate in these many different rituals and festivals and, and worship services as the people of God in that day, they would say, let's draw near to God, as in let's get up and travel towards God who is at the temple. That's where his, again, his very literal presence was represented on the planet earth. That was, the, the temple was spoken of in, in the Bible as his footstool. And so let's draw near to him. And so they would go to Jerusalem to participate in things like the Passover or the Feast of Booths or, th or something like that to draw close to him as close as they could. You could go to the temple, but another thing that we studied in the book of Hebrews is the way the temple was built. Remember, I always described it as an onion. That it's not shaped like an onion, but we can think of it like an onion because it has layers. And depending on who you were, you could go closer and closer and closer to God. It depends, it depends on your credentials, who you were, right? You know, if, if you're a believer, you could go into the court of the Gentiles, right? If you were an uh, ethnic Jew, uh, you could go a, a layer past that. If you were ethnic Jew and a male, you could go a layer closer past that. And then if you were 
the, the high priest, you were the one person out of the whole Jewish nation who could go to the innermost portion of the temple. It was called the Holies, Holy of Holies, and there was a curtain there. And you were terrified to go behind that curtain because as far as representing God's presence on the earth, you could not get any closer than you did when you went behind that curtain. And the high priest is the only person that could go behind that curtain, and only once a year. They would tie a rope to him just in case God killed him because he's not worthy. They could pull him out of that room without having to enter that room. They'd put bells on him so they could listen to see if he's still alive while he was in there. And he would make this sacrifice on behalf of God's people. So that's how you drew near to God in that day. You could get close, but not too close, because the temple itself represented a barrier that was between us and God. And that barrier is sin. He is perfectly holy. We are not. We are not worthy to be in his presence. There is separation between us and God. But because of what Jesus did, everything changed. Let me read it to you again in Hebrews 10. Now, because of what Christ has done, we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Jesus was the sacrifice that made us acceptable to God, and Jesus was the high priest who made that sacrifice. Both He is, he is the, the high priest of all high priests. He is the sacrifice of all sacrifices, and it all happened in the holiest of all places on the planet Earth, Earth the holy of holies. They, you notice a, a theme there that happens when you're reading in Scripture? They say things twice to emphasize the magnitude of what they're talking about. But now collectively, as believers in the gospel, we draw near to God, just like God's people always did, but we do it a little bit differently because of what Christ has done. Now we draw, through, we draw closer to God through the proclamation of what Christ has done by proclaiming him as that ultimate high priest, by proclaiming him as that ultimate sacrifice. What barriers were between us and God have been torn down by Jesus, by the gospel, the, gospel, the, the, the temple is not there. It's been destroyed. It started with that curtain tearing from the, from the middle and just ripping down to the floor when Christ died on the cross. There is no separation, no barrier between us and God. We are fully accepted by God, and we celebrate that acceptance through Christ in a corporate worship just like this. That's what we're doing here. That's the whole point of it. That's the meaning that we attach to this or it's not going to work for you. Christians belong here because we were saved to do this. You were saved to be a part of a community. That's why you were saved. You were brought into this community. It's personal, yes. The salvation that we have is personal, but it's never individualistic. It was meant to, to, be, to be about us drawing near to God. Did you notice that? Let us draw near to God. What do we do when we draw near to God? Verse 23, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he promised, for he who promises faithful. When we gather, we hold fast to the confession of our hope. That's the point. So Christians, we, we don't, this isn't about wishful thinking. This is about gathering together and having a settled confidence in what Jesus has done. That's the point of the gathering. We believe this promise of God through the gospel. And so the primary place that you're taught this is here. The primary place that you are, are reminded of the gospel is right here, right now. The primary place in which you declare the gospel, in which you promote the gospel, it's right here, right now, in corporate worship. We even see the gospel when we gather. We see it when we take communion. We have, we have the elements of communion that, that are symbolic of the meaning of the gospel. And so that's how we remember it. We, when we baptize someone, we see a snapshot before us of the gospel. Someone going from death to life, spiritual life in Christ, just like his death and resurrection, what enabled that spiritual life to happen. 
And so we gather because we need reminded of hope, because we live in a fallen and broken world where there is no hope. You need that hope, and I need that hope. And we go out this week, and we live in this broken world, and we do the best we can, but it gets us down, and we, we start to forget this hope. And, and then we, we don't want to go on church. We don't want to go to church on a Sunday morning because it's complicated, because I don't, I don't feel like it, and because uh, I, my, my spouse and I are arguing and fighting, or, or it, was, it wasn't a great day yesterday with the kids, and so I just don't want to go. I just don't feel like it. And we don't go, and it begins to have a domino effect in our life. If that's not a priority, the truths of the gospel begin to come less and less of a priority. We begin to think about them less and less and less because they're not being presented to us as routinely. We're not prioritizing it. We're not, we're not having Christian brothers and sisters who are there to faithfully present it to us, and we're not presenting it to anyone else. It's having a weakening effect on our faith. We have to admit that we need this because we don't have it all together and we can't do it alone. You need help with your faith. You need accountability with your faith. You need support with your faith. Or you're going to walk away from your faith. That's why we gather. We are people who admit we need help. So any, any, any of this talk or belief that says you can do this without other Christians, that's your pride talking. That's just your pride talking. It's a very prideful thing to say, and us men are the absolute worst at it because we don't want to admit that we need help. We don't want to admit that we, we don't, well, we don't want accountability. So, you know, self-sufficiency is this virtue that us men carry around. So we don't, we don't, want, to, we don't want to admit how much we need the church, but the, the gospel tears down that pride when it saves us, and we don't have to be the hero because Jesus is the hero. And so because... Because of that, corporate worship is something very sacred to us. It's something that's very special to us. And we should do everything that we possibly can to make it special, to make it important. I told you I wanted to give you six practical pieces of advice on how to make Sunday morning special. And they are, they are not, this isn't rocket science. It's, it's practical, and this was an important thing to me as I craft these sermons as we consider corporate worship. This is so important to me because at the end of the day, people want to know, how do I do this? Okay, you're teaching me how to think right. You're, you're, you're telling me these things, but how can I, pra what does this look like? So I wanted to give you just like six practical ways that you can very intentionally make this time special, make this day special, and just ways that you can be really careful. We're just not careful with Sunday like we should be. We got to be careful with it, man. We're talking about people's faith here. We're talking about the gospel here. You got to be careful with that stuff. Here's, here's one way you can make today special. Determine you're going to be here before Sunday morning. If you take this wait and see approach, to Sunday mornings, you're going to become inconsistent with your attendance on Sunday morning, right? I mean, if I take a wait and see approach to working out, it never pans out well for me. Because more often than not, I wake up that day, I'll see how I feel tomorrow, and then I'll work out. Well, I never get out of bed and think, boy, I want to start running around in circles. No. I, I, I always feel like not working out. The only way that I'm ever going to work out is if I determine I'm going to work out at a certain day and a certain time before that certain time arrives. That is the only way it's ever going to happen. If you take a wait and see approach to Sunday morning, I'll see how I feel and then I'll go to church. You won't be here. Second thing, real practical. This is a big one. You need to get adequate sleep on a Saturday night before you come to church on a Sunday morning. Oh, man, oh, I've been guilty of that one. That one hurts. Promise I'm not picking on anybody here today. I mean, goodness, our service is at 10 a.m., people. I'm not asking a whole lot here. I mean, can you get to bed before midnight? You can get an adequate amount of sleep to think when you're here. But right, if you want to contemplate these things fairly, you want, to, you want to be able to process this information in a meaningful way, your brain's got to be on. If you come here just completely exhausted, now sometimes, hey, it's true, sometimes your schedule, things happen, 
busy, there's busier seasons of life than others and things get in the way and you just got to drag yourself to church that day. I get it. Sometimes I have dragged myself. Every time we do those stupid stern wheeler fireworks that everybody loves, I have to drag myself to church the next day because I can't get home because of all the traffic until, I don't know, the sun's coming up. But I mean, you know, things happen, life happens, but if you don't, if, if you routinely don't get an adequate amount of sleep on a Saturday night, why would you expect to, to get a lot out of today? I, I'll never forget someone who came to the journey for years who notoriously played video games until about 5 a.m. And unless we were standing and singing, they were dozing off. I would get up here, and before I would even open my notebook, I could see their head doing this. <laughs> I was like, I don't have a chance. I don't think they ever heard a word I said. And, and guess what? They don't go to church anymore. You could argue they never went to church in the first place. Were they ever here? You know, if we think about church and think about Sunday morning a little differently, though, like we do some other things in my life, it helps. Like when you think about maybe uh, you got a big day at work Monday, you got something important happening, you got a deadline you got to meet, you got an important day ahead of you. What do you do? You prepare for that day. You start preparing for that day right now. If I got a big day tomorrow, I want to do some practical things. I want to do some things that help me focus on the things that I need to focus on that day. So I want to unclutter that day. I want to do things like pick out my outfit now. I want to do things like, you know, get my notes and things in order now so that tomorrow I don't have to organize or figure that stuff out so I can be focused on that big day and the big thing that needs done on that day. Are we treating church like that? Or is it just a wait-and-see approach? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll do this, maybe I won't. You can make it special, though. You can. That's your choice to make it special or not. Here's the third thing. Start your day reading the Bible. You know, it's, it, it's true that this is, uh, it is personal, but it's not individualistic. But that personal component should really play a big part in every Sunday that you worship corporately with the church. And it starts with you getting up in the, in, in the morning and cracking open your Bible. You know, just maybe studying and reading over the passage that you know I'm going to preach. I'm the most predictable preacher you'll ever have. <laughs> like, oh, it, like we start a book like Galatians. Oh, guess what is ne next week? Oh, it's, it's the next paragraph. I could read that before I get to church and draw conclusions prayerfully on that passage of Scripture so I don't have to put all my eggs in that pastor's basket. I can come up with my own thoughts because I can think on my own and I can, I can start to draw conclusions and then test what I think against what he thinks and, and test both what I think and what he thinks against what the Scripture is actually saying. And, and I can be changed by it in a productive way. It all starts with you getting up in the morning and opening that Bible and making it personal. You say it's personal. Make it personal. Get up and crack open your Bible on a Sunday morning before you come to church. Number four, not a surprise here, pray before you get here. Pray for your experience at church. Again, if you take that wait and see approach, you'll wait till the very last second to do everything and just barely get here and, and, and just show up and you'll just let it play out however it play out, plays out. And maybe it'll be good, maybe it'll be bad, I don't know. But if you're praying for that in, in advance, you will find that your time here is way, way, way different. It is way more meaningful when you start praying for a church service, a corporate gathering of worship. It will, it, it's going to hit way different when you're praying for it in advance. Praying that, that God's gospel will be proclaimed with clarity. Pray that it will be about what it's supposed to actually be about. Pray that all of those distractions and and, and, and things that are just seem to be a nuisance with church wouldn't be a nuisance today that you can actually, you know, pray for someone. That's number five. Pray for someone specifically. Number five, pray for somebody specifically that you know will be here. I want them specifically to have an amazing day of worship. When you're praying for someone to have an amazing day of worship before you interact with them at church, you're going to be inclined to do something to make sure that happens. You're going to go over and you're going to try to minister to them in any practical way you can think of because they're already on your mind before you get here. You're going to do anything you can to, to make them feel w welcome if they're a visitor or whatever it may be. 
But you're only going to do that if you're, if you're careful with it, if you're intentional about it. And then number six, this one's a big one, and this one's one that I want you to maybe really take an action step on uh, that's, that's going to be maybe different. Sunday should be a day of traditions. I want to be careful with how I say that. This is, this is a common thing that I've heard from baby boomers. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll have a little generational discussion here. And if you have a conversation with a baby boomer who grew up in church, I bet you they have a story like this. And I've heard it from so many, even in my own family and people I know. They'll say, boy, when I was young, you start there and you start to fall asleep because they're telling a story. But then you, if, you, if you manage to tune in back in, what they, what they have to tell you I think is valuable. They'll say, when I was young, aside from walking to school uphill both ways, when we went to church, after church, every Sunday, the whole family got together and had a huge meal. And we all cooked and cleaned and laid around and had fun together, and the whole family got together. Have you ever heard a baby boomer tell that story? I bet you there are baby boomers in here right now that have that story growing up. I'm related to so many. And I think, whatever happened to that? Why did the baby boomers grow up that way, but a lot of them didn't continue that in their life with their kids and their grandkids? You can change that. I feel like that's a great way to leave a legacy. We're going to go and worship corporately with the family of God, the body of Christ. We're going to invest and spend time together in worship as a family, as a church. And then I'm going to gather my family, my blood family together for a big meal and time together, quality time together. What a great tradition. And because that tradition was so special and so meaningful, it left a legacy of faith. It contributed to that legacy of faith. Maybe you could start that over. Maybe you could ignite that. But it didn't have to be a family meal. You know, I think just a day of traditions. Make it meaningful. Make it different. A Sunday afternoon nap is a tradition. That's my all-time favorite tradition. I love that tradition. If I can sneak in a nap this week, it's only ever going to happen on that Sunday afternoon, and I love it. It's so rejuvenating. Maybe it's family time in the evening. Maybe it's, maybe it's reading your Bible or having special prayer time in the evening, but making that entire day unlike any other day in your week. It's supposed to be about that which is nourishing and rejuvenating for you, for your, for your week ahead. Now, don't, again, don't, don't become unrealistic with this. Don't become legalistic with it. Oh, it has to, I, can't, I can't pull this off every single Sunday. Nah, we're so busy right now. I feel so guilty that the pastor's even saying this because I don't even have time for lunch today. The thought of preparing a meal for the entire family, is, it, it makes me nauseous right now. I'm just so busy. And don't become legalistic about this and don't become unrealistic. I'm human and normal too. My family's, we got a basketball game tonight that we're headed to, right? I mean, we're, we're normal. We have things going on. It's going to happen. But by and large, how can I make Sunday a day that just hits different than every day of the week? That is such a practical thing that you can do to be careful with corporate worship, to be, to be intentional about it. That day should be about restoration. It starts, for the Christian, it starts by a restoration of our souls, making our faith personal, but making our faith about us at the same time. We gather and we remember, and it helps us to persevere. It's a time of strengthening. All of that is a time for strengthening spiritually, physically, emotionally, psychologically. It's all supposed to be restorative. It's how God's designed it to be. Are you reaping that benefit? You should be reaping that benefit, but if you're not making provisions to reap that benefit, you're not going to reap it. If it's not a priority, if it's not being what it was meant to be, it's not going to hit like it's supposed to hit in your life. It's not going to work for you. But there's some pretty practical ways in which you can make this work and so have that discussion. Talk that out as a family. Create those traditions if they're not already there. Or make new traditions that center around corporate worship. This is when we focus on the right things and the critical things of life. I mean, really, what matters in life? So many things we involve ourselves in are things that we got to do. It's part of our job or career or whatever, things that we want to accomplish in life. But what matters most? 
our faith in God and our family? Are we making provisions for those things? Take a stand. Draw a line in the sand. Make a change. Start doing it. We're going to do that as we close out our service today. We're going to focus on the right things by communion. We're going to have a whole sermon on communion. I can't wait for it. But it's a time that we remember the gospel so we can see the gospel right now. Hold it in our hands and think about it. Let's pray, and then we'll do that together. Lord, again, I thank you for this time of worship. I thank you for, the, for your design of the church that it would provide for us in all of these meaningful ways. Lord, so many times church feels discouraging and hard. And a lot of times it feels that way because we get it wrong. We get distracted. It's not working for us because we stop, we stop thinking about it right. We stop making it, about, making it about what it's supposed to be about. Lord, help this teaching series to be a time of correction, that this can increase in meaning, that it can increase in, the, the, in gospel-centeredness, and that, Lord, that we can proclaim your truth in a way that is helpful, clear, and practical over these next eight weeks. We ask all of these things in your son's name, Jesus. Jesus.